All right, we are back. Happy Wednesday. Good to see you. Uh, chapter 10, we're starting the big five reactions here. See if we know the names and the products and all the reagents there. Uh, homework 10 will be due on Friday. We should be able to finish by then. Chapter 11 will be alkynes. We'll start on Monday. I think Monday and Wednesday. Wednesday, we should have time for review also, because I think ch uh, test three starts next week. It's over these three chapters, chapters nine uh, through 11 there. Um, let's stay here and look at the overhead and look at something. So we talked about structure last time of alkenes and naming. Uh, acetylenes, of course, will be coming up here. But if you look at these computer generated electrostatic models here where they're colorized based on the electron density, the red orange colors are high electron density. The green and blue areas are low electron density or electropositive parts of the molecule. So you can see the pi bond here for ethylene that I've drawn there and the computer showing it very red where the pi bond is both top and bottom then a settling kind of barrel shaped and then benzene. Benzene will be a topic in 352. We'll see that early on uh, next semester. Nomenclature, we left off with that. Did a few of these. I, I said I'd show you uh, enols here. The alcohol does get priority over the alkene. So you have to number here from the end, one, two, three, and it's a five hexene. That's where the alkenes start. And I've got a bunch of other examples here. Uh, enines, the alkene normally has priority. That gets the one uh, position there. And also uh, dienes, uh, alkadienes are the, the ways to name dienes. And you have to show where the two alkenes start there, four, five, dienol. So some of these are harder examples. And some are combining enines here and some cyclic ones. Oh, and we got the EZ. Nomenclature here. Now I said for a medium sized ring, you don't need to say whether it's cis or trans. It's always assumed to be cis or Z. Uh, so that's kind of superfluous, I think there, but these are all the IUPAC names for those compounds. And you can look through them. These graphics are on Learning Suite if you want to look at some of those uh, different ones. Alkene Hall of Fame. Yeah, there's a ton of molecules here. Alkenes are very important. We've seen a couple of these before, and you can kind of look through that and see what some of those are. Polyenes, uh, especially conjugated ones, can often be colored. And that's because the gap between the filled and the empty molecular orbital gets very small when they're conjugated, when they're right next to each other. So like carotene, which is what? The color uh, orange in nature. <laughs> you see it in fruits and vegetables all over the place. It absorbs way down here at uh, 400 nanometers. Remember, visible light is 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength uh, radiation. And, and so that's absorbing actually in the blue region. And what you see is the color that's not absorbed which is more in the red, orange, yellow uh, region. And lycopene, anybody know what that molecule is in nature? It's red in nature, so it's in what fruits, vegetables? It's in uh, tomatoes, okay? <laughs> and any other red colored uh, natural materials, lycopene, yeah. And then we got squalene, which is not conjugated. The double bonds are isolated, actually. And polyenes will be a topic also in 352, but I wanted to show you how alkenes, you know, we can have multiple alkenes. And here's a reaction we'll learn later on in 352 also, reacting alkenes. Although I think that was a homework problem, just to push electrons there, the Diels-Alder reaction. But yeah, don't worry about that. So just, you know, know the basics of that. Oh, vision. Uh, showed this to you the first day of class. It's based on carotene, so your mom was right, you know, eat your carrots, eat your fruits, vegetables, because this is converted in the liver to this guy, retinol, retinol, vitamin A. And here's the full IUPAC name for retinol. Thank goodness for common names, right? Retinol is a lot easier to say than all this right here. <laughs> it's anona tetraenal, <laughs> al meaning it's an aldehyde, and it's what, a, a tetraene, one, two, three, four, and it's got a cyclohexenyl group on it. So a lot of things there. And what it does in the eye, it harvests uh, visible light. So here's H nu for a photon of light. 
Uh, first, the, the thing is isomerize to retinal, which is cis here, this geometry here. So that's by an enzyme, isomerase. Then it's covalently linked to a protein called opsin. This is in the back of the eyeball in the retina, okay? The cone and the rod cells, maybe you've heard about in the eye. Uh, the cis form is, is where it starts out at, or the Z form, right there. When it absorbs the light, you see it excites the electrons. It uncouples the two electrons, which allows for rotation around this bond. So I said that you can rotate around cis and trans double bonds if you do something to it high energy-wise. And this is certainly a high energy event. Happens very quickly, picosecond. It can isomerize around there. Go to the transform. That's a conformational change, which changes the conformation of the receptor for opsin. Okay, and this is a uh, G-coupled protein in the cell membrane uh, that impacts on the optical nerve that then gives the image into the brain. And we don't know a lot about that. We know a lot about the mechanism of how light is harvested with this cofactor in this protein, but we do not know how the brain actually creates the image that you see in your mind. And by the way, that's an artificial construct of your brain, right? When you're looking at things throughout the day, you think, oh, those are all real, aren't they? <laughs> no, that's just how your brain perceives it based on the light coming in your eyes. So that's a, a very profound philosophical thing, I think. But it, it's based on this cis-trans isomerization, which is kind of cool. And opsin actually has three isoforms that correspond to the three primary colors of light, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so that's harvesting the different uh, wavelengths there. Anyway. Okay, so a lot of other double bonds in nature. We've got the fatty acids. Uh, steric acid is, is lard. Um, you see that in marbling in a steak, for example, or Crisco, the cooking material for baking, whatever. It's a, what, solid at room temperature because it's fully saturated, okay? If you have an unsaturated fat, this is oleic acid, typical of uh, plant oils, uh, typified by olive oil, for example. Uh, it has a much lower melting point because of the cis double bond right at the nine position. It's harder in the crystalline state to pack together because it has this kink in the backbone. So lower melting point there. If you have two or three, and actually have four for arachidonic acid, the melting points keep going down, okay? And that's because there's these kinking within the structures and it can't pack together. Steric acid, you see, in the all anti-conformation can pack together very efficiently and have a high melting point, okay? So the more double bonds you see. And there's the shapes. You can see steric acid would pack together very nicely in the solid state. Oleic acid's kind of a, a V-shape. Linolenic and linoleic and linoleic have more double bonds and uh, more of a kink here which even lowers the melting point more. All right, let's get to the main event, which is the reactions, the five H's. <laughs> let's see if we can do these now. So what do we have? Hydrohalogenation of alkenes. Okay, all the same substrates, right? Hydration, and as it implies there, hydrohalogenation, adding hydrogen in a halide. So it's HBr or HCl. And then we have, in this presence of a strong acid, water, so we can hydrate the double bond. We can halogenate with molecular chlorine or bromine. So this is Cl2 or Br2, okay, with no water present, with no acid present, just the molecular halogen. We'll go to the dihalide, call it halogenation, okay? So they're all H, which might help you out, <laughs> or it might make it more confusing, but keep those terms straight and keep the reagents straight. I think that'll help you out. And then we have what? Halohydrin formation. I think that's the most unfortunate term. That's an old uh, uh, term meaning halogen alcohol formation, okay? And there it is, halogen uh, bromine, uh, molecular bromine or chlorine in the presence of water. So it's kind of combining these two here, right? So here we get the halo alcohol product. And mechanistically, you'll see why, okay? So here we, we add halogen and then alcohol. And then hydroboration, that's with borane, BH3, which is the hydride just to the left of uh, carbon there. You see boron uh, is the third element over 
so it has three valence electrons. It has an empty molecular orbital here, which makes it very electrophilic. That's going to grab onto the alkene and actually be our electrophile in this case. And then um, hydrides delivered to the other carbon. And then we oxidize a boron carbon bond with peroxide to go to the alcohol. Okay. Now, you might think, well, hydroboration, that's an alcohol. Hydration, that's an alcohol. Why do we need two reactions? Well, they'll have different selectivity. Hydration will do Markovnikov hydration and give us the more substituted alcohol. Hydroboration will give us the less substituted alcohol. So we say they have complementary regioselectivity, which side of the alkene they go to. All right, let's go to the board here, go through the reactions and uh, see which ones we need to know. So first of all, the general term, uh, you know, it's electrophilic addition to alkenes and all these reagents will be electrophilic. You don't always see a plus charge there, but they are electron deficient. And we'll push the electrons such that we're generating an electropositive side of the reagent. And our nucleophile then is actually just, what, the alkene, okay? It's not a lone pair like we've talked about for charged nucleophiles or the neutral nucleophiles for SN2 and SN1. But an alkene with its pair of electrons in the pi bond can function that way, okay? And that pi bond's relatively weak, right? It's 60 kcals per mole relative to a sigma bond, which is 90 kcals. So, and here's the, uh, the way the electrons come out, right? All the mechanisms are the same. Yay, there's only one mechanism. <laughs> well, there's some nuances to it, but uh, you know, believe me now, this is, this is how we're gonna push the electrons. So push the electrons out of the pi bond, grab the electrophile of the reagent. It's gonna give us an intermediate that'll look like this. I have a carbocation, okay, and a new bond to the electron. There, this new sigma bond right here is where the pi bonds were, right, of pi electrons. We pull them out, form this new bond. Well, that will give a dearth of charge here then on the opposite side, right? And that's where a plus charge will be. And then a nucleophile can go on there, right, and give us the product, okay? But it's electrophilic addition in that the reagent that triggers it is electron deficient or electrophilic. All right, let's look at the specific one, uh, hydrohalogenation, HBr or HCl. The more substituted the alkene is, the faster this goes. We don't use HF hydrofluoride, hydrofluoric acid. It's generally too weak. It's too slow, those reactions. We don't generally use HI in that that's too corrosive and too reactive of an acid. The pKa of of HI is actually minus nine. It's more acidic than HBr, HCl. The HBr and HCl are fine. The carbon halogen bonds are stable enough in that case. So we can add those across there. So there's a typical example here. We can think about how exothermic this reaction might be. What we're breaking uh, the uh, pi bond, which is gonna cost us, what, about 60 kcals? And then we're breaking it. Uh, hydrogen bromide bond, which is about 80 kcals or so. And then we're getting what? A carbon hydrogen bond, which is around 90, which is really high. And remember, these are negative numbers over here, the bonds we're making. And a carbon bromine bond is also around 60, 70 or so. So overall, if you add it up, it's definitely exothermic, okay? <laughs> You're gonna get negative energy for for delta H, we should just say delta H, okay? That's more specific there. And then we got one where we're adding HCl here to cyclohexene, and you see there. And we don't often draw, you know, the other hydrogens, but you should recognize that that hydrogen is right there. And the hydrogen that we put on and the halide there are right adjacent to each other where the, uh, where the alkene carbons were, right? Um, so if we have one like this, to trans to butene HBr, what do we get here? Well, we get uh, the uh, the two bromo product. Cis or the trans one would work the same way. And by the way, <laughs> uh, the one uh, butene will also give that same product. So we have to look at the mechanism now. So what are we talking about here on the mechanism? <laughs> so we've got uh, HBr, okay? 
So what are we going to do? What's the electrophilic part here? Well, it's the proton. So this is polarized, what, toward the more electronegative bromine, so that hydrogen on HBr is what? Partially positive. In fact, you can ionize that ahead of time, like regular acids do, right? There's a proton right there. Well, let's go ahead and grab it, okay? What does that do? That generates uh, this. And that's what? A secondary carbocation. That looks good. And then how do we finish the mechanism? Well, bromide's still there. And bromide can attack there and give us that. Okay. Well, let's look at an unsymmetric alkene here. How about this one? Let's switch over to HCl. So propene uh, with uh, H HCl. So what are we going to do here? Let's attack here. But now this is not symmetric like this one here. Right? This is a disubstitutalkene. There's two methyl groups on each side. Here we have an unsymmetric alkene. This side has a methyl, and this side has two hydrogens. So where are we going to put the proton? Let's see. Put the proton here. Or how else could we do this? Put it there. Which one looks better and why? What do you think? The one on the left versus the one on the right. And what type of carbocations are these? That's really the key. This one is what? A secondary carbocation? This one's primary? Which one? Well, maybe we can have a vote today. <laughs> Who says the one on the left is going to be the favored pathway? Okay. Oh, it looks like everybody. <laughs> We're unanimous this morning. <laughs> Anybody want to argue for the primary? Well, we already know this is much more stable, right? The secondary, the more substituted one due to hyperconjugation and all the stabilizing effects, inductive effects. That makes that pathway better, faster. The electrophile goes on the end, and that will be typical of everything. <laughs> Put the electrophile on the end, okay, if it's an unsymmetric alkene, and that will hold for hydroboration as well. And there the electrophile will be borane. So it's really the same effect, even though the, the selectivity will, will switch around in the end. And then what do we get for our product here? Chloride goes on here. So we get the uh, secondary chloride. We get the two chloropropane product, right? We do not get the one, okay? And that would be going through the higher energy pathway. There's a term for this. This was empirically observed over 100 years ago by Markovnikov. And I'll just abbreviate that. Any Russian speakers out there, Russian missionaries, there's usually a couple. And I always ask, what does Markovnikov mean in Russian? And it means carrot, <laughs> which is kind of funny there. But a carrot is a motivating factor, at least for a horse or a donkey, right? <laughs> can motivate a, a donkey with a carrot or a stick, right? And here we're motivating this reaction with a more stable carbocation. There you go. We're tying it in with Russian uh, terminology there. Markovnikov's famous chemist, along with Zaitsev and Mendeleev at the Kazan University in, near the Ural Mountains in Russia. I think it was before the revolution. So these were famous Russian chemists. Anyway, we'll just say Markovnikov. And that's the pathway that gives the more stable carbocation. And this forms faster. And that's by the Hammond postulate. The transition state leading to this will be lower. Why? Because in that transition state, the character of the carbocation is borne out. This one will be slower kinetically, okay, with a higher transition state by Hammond's postulate. So that's more theory. Markovnikov didn't know anything about... Uh, the uh, structures or the mechanism of this. He just empirically observed the more substituted uh, halogens were generally the, the favorite product. But uh, we know from, from uh, more recent theory, Hammond's postulate, the transition states, the character of these intermediates is borne out in that transition state, making this pathway slower, less stable, okay, and not favored. <laughs> okay, don't put that down. We'll uh, have to take away points. Put down the more substituted one there. Uh, let's go back to the butene one. 
briefly. And the butene one I said was this one. So if we have the alkene here at the one position, one butene, let's do that also with HBr. And look at this, the two butene gave two bromo butane. What about this one? <laughs> it gives that same thing. Why does it give the same thing? Well, if we protonate out on the end, we get the same secondary carbocation. And that's where it goes. We have to invoke Markovnikov selectivity here. Here it's symmetric, right? We have to form the, the secondary carbocation, but here we could have formed the secondary or the primary carbocation. So the, this one, giving the same product as that one, goes through the same intermediate, right? But here we put the proton on the end, okay? We're doing that other example. Everybody see that? Okay, so some similarities there in the mechanism. All right, let's do some other examples. Get some other ones up here. Um, let's see, how about this one? HBr, how about this one? HCl, and how about this one? <laughs> HBr. See if we can figure these out. So here, if we go through the mechanism, where are we gonna put the proton? We're gonna put it on the end, right? We're gonna generate what type of carbocation? Tertiary. So can we just go right to the product here in this case? Yeah, I think we can. It'll be that, that guy, the tertiary bromide. Everybody see that okay? Go through the mechanism and convince yourself of that. How about this one, HCl? Here we have a tri-substituted alkene now. Uh, so yeah, we put the proton at the less substituted spot and we put the nucleophile at the more substituted spot. That's another way of saying Markovnikov addition. Electrophile on the end, nucleophile on the more substituted spot, okay? And it comes out of the mechanism. Ha, huh, how about this one? <laughs> Let me give you the product and let's see if mechanistically we can figure out what happened here. <laughs> Okay, it's not this. Let's see, this is what you might expect. But guess what? This is not the product. It's this right here. So what happened? I think you can tell. Anybody give us an idea, a hint here? What may have happened? We are forming a carbocation. So what do you see in this substrate? You see branching, right? So what can happen if we have a carbocation here? Let's go through the mechanism and see if we can rationalize this. So we get the carbocation right here. Everybody with me so far on that? So that's Markovnikov protonation. We put the proton out here. Again, we don't always draw it. This is now a methyl group on the end, right? It had two hydrogens to begin with. Now it's a methyl and a secondary carbocation. Well, that would be our product we'd expect there, right? on the far right. Why isn't that the product though? This is a secondary. What can occur here now? Anybody remember? Yeah. Methyl shift, very good. So that one, two methyl shift because it's highly branched here with that terp-butyl group. And by doing that motion there, we generate this, okay? And we saw that before when we looked at alcohol halogenation, remember the previous chapter? And this is very similar to alcohol halogenation under strong acid conditions that went through a carbocation, right? And if there was branching, remember we said the shift possibility was always there. And then this is uh, the simple step to get to the product. It's just bromide formation there. So it's not this one. With branching, it's the more substituted uh, alcohol product. All right, let's look at uh, one more in the series. And I think I've got the overhead for it, Cheshire. And let's go back up here briefly. Oh, there's the exothermic calculation with some actual numbers. And I added in kcals there for you. And you see these reactions are quite exothermic. And that's because you're breaking a pi bond, which is relatively weak. And even though a carbon halogen bond's relatively weak, you know, it's only 68 kcals, uh, it's still uh, overall exothermic by quite a bit. 
So quite a bit of heat is generated in these reactions. And there's the transition state. Uh, we can talk about, you know, Hammond's postulate there. Uh, anything that will stabilize this intermediate will affect the height of this transition state. Okay. Uh, and there it is. Uh, primary would be higher. Uh, secondary position is lower um, in that regard. Ah, this is the one I wanted to show you. <laughs> this is a tricky one. I didn't want to draw this all out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but let's see. So this is a tetra substitute alkene, right? We've done mono, di, and tri substitute alkene. So here we have two methyl groups on cyclohexene. And if we protonate there, look, we'll get a stereocenter here, right? So that hydrogen can be down or it can be up. These intermediates are actually enantiomers of each other, aren't they? One stereocenter. This is flat here where the carbocation is. So it's just the one stereocenter. And, you know, there's, these are both achiral to begin with, so there's no preference. You get a 50-50 mix of these intermediates. But now what can go on? Chloride has to attack the tertiary carbocation. There's no shift here. It goes right to a tertiary, right? So no shift needed. But look, chloride can either come up on the bottom here from below, or it can come up on the top here. <laughs> now those two stereocenters are different from each other. But these were the same coming from this right here. So A and B are actually, what, diastereomeric products to each other. <laughs> now, if we attack from the top or the bottom here, on this carbocation, look, we'll generate the enantiomer of that one right there, because both centers are inverted, and we'll generate the enantiomer of those there. So you could just say DL for any of those. In fact, you know, <clears throat> You might say, well, is there a preference for A or B because they're diastereomeric? And look, chloride's coming in either on the top, which is where that methyl group is. So might, there might be less of B. From the approach from the bottom is where the smaller hydrogen is. There might be more of A. I'm not going to have you learn those rules and everything. That's an advanced topic. Just recognize you're generating two stereocenters here in the product. <laughs> So how many possible isomers? Two stereocenters means two to the two power. So that's a possibility of four. And here they all are. And I think the mechanism accounts for all four of them. That, that's all I expect you to know there. And I, th I think that's good on that. Questions on that one? That's kind of a tricky one, but it was in your book. All right, let's go to hydration then and see what we need to know here. This is the second reaction. And hydration means just that. We're adding the elements of water, forming an alcohol from the alkene. So let's start with a tetra substituted one here for the fun of it and react it with water. Now, if that's all we do, guess what? No reaction. <laughs> Alkenes and alcohols will swim around together uh, forever and not do a thing. <laughs> No reaction. What do we need to add here? We need to add sulfuric acid. And when we add that acid, and actually we just need a drop, it just needs to be a catalytic amount. You'll see from the mechanism uh, why that is. We will regenerate some acid here. Once that's in there, the presence of water and alkene, it goes like a shot. And it'll go right to the alcohol product. Okay. And there's the elements of water. It'll be the same thing, Markovnikov. We'll put the proton on the end carbon. And what's our nucleophile now? Not halide, but water, okay? So uh, it's, it's that reaction. We did what? The dehydration reaction before, right? And that dehydration was alcohols in the presence of acid and heat. And that went backwards there. Why can we do it in the forward direction now? Now we have water as a reagent, excess water. In fact, that's usually a solvent. So if we have excess of the water, the presence of strong acid, we go to the alcohol. And notice we, we did this before, strong acid, the presence of halide, okay? Well, halide there was nucleophilic enough to go on. And we did halogenations of alcohols too. So halogenation of alkenes is very similar. And now hydration with the water in excess with an alkene going to the alcohol product. So hopefully that makes some sense. So if we have our friend here, butene, we'll go to this alcohol, okay? If we have a tri-substitute alkene, we'll go to what? We'll go to 
the more substitute alcohol, okay? Notice we would have had a choice here, primary alcohol or secondary alcohol. No, the Markovnikov product is what? Uh, the nucleophile goes to the more substituted spot. Same thing here, more substituted uh, alcohol product. All right, let's look at the mechanism. And what do we get there? Our mechanism uh, is going to be this. That acid with a proton is going to be our electrophile, right? Because without that acid, nothing happens. The water is just around at the end to uh, attack the, the uh, carbocation. So let's go ahead and protonate. And what do we get here? We get the carbocation. Okay. And then what? Water can attack. Two lone pairs. Let's go ahead and attack. And notice when water attacks, you don't go directly to the alcohol you go to the hydronium ion. So sorry, there's a couple steps here. <laughs> Mechanism's a little more involved than uh, hydrohalogenation. Hydration gives us the hydronium cation. These two hydrogens are on there. It's not hydroxide, right? It's not OH minus, it's neutral water, okay? It's acidic condition. Don't draw hydroxide there, <laughs> okay? In fact, that's kind of a hallmark. If you're in strong acid, your intermediates, if they're charged, are going to be positively charged. Things are going to be protonated. <laughs> Don't all of a sudden come up with an anion or a strong base in the presence of strong acid. Yeah, that's not compatible. So here we got the uh, positively charged guy. And so how do we get to this neutral alcohol product? Well, we could use a couple of things. Well, let's see. What did we say before? or an excess water, <laughs> but we do have a little bit of bisulfate, right? Which one's going to be a better base to take off this proton? Because that's what we need to do, right? And if we take off the proton here, we'll get hydronium ion. And that's okay. That's a pretty strong acid. It's a pKa of minus two. But look, if we use bisulfate, we go back to sulfuric acid, which has an even lower pKa which means we'll be generating an even stronger acid. In fact, if it's sulfuric acid in the presence of water, it's all this, right? That's what a strong acid means. In fact, we could invoke that at the beginning. Sulfuric acid in the water would be this. So why not just use that as the initial electrophile? And that would be fine as well, okay? Whatever you want to show there. In fact, we'd let you start off these reactions by just saying this. <laughs> That's your electrophile. Can you kind of see that those are all the same? <laughs> okay. And it, there's actually no free H plus floating around in there. It's actually associated with something in solution. <laughs> it's either on the sulfuric acid or on water. But any one of those would suffice. You get to this intermediate, that's, that's got to be there consistent. You don't go directly to the alcohol, and then something has to take it off. I would prefer you to use water, okay? because that is actually the better base. Generates the weaker acid. If you use this, this is actually a weaker base, which would be generating a stronger acid, okay? Anyway, you should at least see that. But that gives us the Markovnikov alcohol product. And I think you can do the other ones there, okay? Uh, let's do this one here. <clears throat> so we've got a vinyl group on this cyclobutane and a methyl group there, okay? And let's do this with uh, sulfuric acid and water. And what will be our product? Let's see. Hmm. Well, you might think it would be this. But yeah, you can already tell that that's not gonna be the product. <laughs> Although that would be the Markovnikov addition to that alkene. But mechanistically, it's going to give something else. And sorry about that. It's actually this. This is your product. <laughs> so what went on here? Another what? Shift, right? And that's relieving the angle strain here. Let's go ahead and protonate and see if we can use the mechanism to figure this out. 
So there's our first step. And yeah, if we just detect with water here, we'd expect that to be the, the final product shown there, but that's not the product, sorry. Okay, what is the product? Well, here you can imagine what? A shift of this carbon-carbon bond on the side of the cyclobutane, right? <laughs> And that allows us to go from a secondary carbocation to what? This tertiary carbocation. Everybody see that? So we got the secondary carbocation shifting over to the tertiary. And then what? Attack with water. Now I think you can do the rest of the mechanism. Attack with water. That will give us, uh, what, hydronium ion again? which would look like this. Sorry, need a little more room there. Uh, yeah, so we just expanded the ring because it went to tertiary and we lost that angle strain, that theta angle strain in the cyclobutane. Now we're strain free and very stable and water can attack there, yeah, and lose the proton and this would be your product. So what do you always look for? <laughs> if you have a carbocation, look for branching. And that's where there might be the shift possibility. We've seen it a couple times now, right? Yes, question. Cyclopentane? Yeah, so cyclopentane would have a lot of angle strain as well. Cyclobutane is well known because the, the one shift will go over to the more stable cyclopentane. Yeah, so cyclobutane turns out to be a little more common. A trickier one like this on a quiz or a test, we give you the product and ask you to figure it out. But these simpler ones where we've shown you some typical examples of shifts, you should be able to handle the simpler ones, okay? With, with halogenation, with, with hydrohalogenation, and now with hydration, right? Yes, question. Do we need to know? Uh, you should recognize, so your byproduct here. The question is, do we need to draw H3O plus uh, as part of the product? Uh, no, but you see that that is the catalyst. It's regenerating, could go back and start. So you should be able to account for the fact that we can only, that we don't need to add a full equivalent of strong acid. Sometimes we do if it's small enough scale, but uh, a catalytic amount will often do it. So yeah, the question being, do we need to draw this? No, you can just focus on the product. Okay, yeah. But mechanistically, you know, you can uh, keep track of that. Okay, here's a variation. I like to throw these in. <laughs> this is a bonus reaction <laughs> for hydration. It's gonna be uh, hydro etherification. <laughs> Okay, so we have hydration formation of an alcohol. How about this? What if we do this? Could you figure this one out? Let me give you the product. And let's see if we can figure it out. I think we can. Methyl terpbutyl ether, MBTE. This isn't hydration anymore. There's no water here, but there's what? Methanol. <laughs> Methanol and ethanol can do these type of reactions with alkenes in the presence of catalytic acid too. So what would occur here? Well, the same thing, protonate, carbocation. Now what? Water, that's what we just talked about. Well, what else could go on there as a weak nucleophile? <laughs> the methanol, right? <laughs> so we can get this. which is what? The same thing, hydronium ion, right? How do we get to the neutral product? We need a base. What base should we use? Well, why not methanol? Use more methanol, grab that proton, flow the electrons down. Yeah, there's our ether product. <laughs> so this is called hydro what, etherification. It's a bonus reaction. I told you there were only five reactions in chapter 10. Maybe I lied. No, this is the same thing as hydration, but it's just with a, a small alcohol. And I think you can see how that works okay. All right, let's see about halogenation now. Let's get some uh, room here. Question on that one? 
I think everybody see how it's very similar to hydration? Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, do halogenation. This is reaction three. <laughs> okay. That hydroetherification is a bonus one, let's say. So here's halogenation. And what are we talking about here? We're using Br2 or Cl2. We don't use F2, fluorine, molecular fluorines, an explosive reagent, very corrosive, and H and iodine, uh, I2, uh, carbon iodine bonds are less stable. And that one's often reversible to form the diiodide. Generally, bromine and chlorine are the ones you need to worry about here. Now let's look at that bond. Chlorine, chlorine bond. Polar or nonpolar? Why are we considering this a useful reagent? That's what, a nonpolar bond, right? It's symmetric. But what is it about halogens? They're very electronegative. <laughs> and this is a very weak bond. Okay, so you can temporarily induce a temporary dipole in this molecule, okay? These electrons are sloshing around. This is a big molecule, very polarizable, and very weak bond here, okay? So we could imagine this being polarized temporarily, and this partially positive end would be attractive to what? That electron-rich alkene, and indeed it is. So let's see if we take you know, chlorine with ethylene, we can form dichloroethane, okay? And quite quickly, too. This is very exothermic, actually. This bond is very weak. What is it? It's only like 50-some kcals per mole. Bromine is down in the 40 range, okay? That bond can easily break. So, uh, you know, got all sorts of variations here. Bromine with butene will give us this. And the two halogens always end up on the same carbons, okay, adjacent to each other, like that. Um, now, does this one say chiral? This one is chiral. That is a stereocenter. So you could say DL and draw, what, two enantiomers there for that. This is not a stereocenter here. Don't need to worry about that. What about this, though? This is kind of the interesting one. Bromine. We're going to form the dibromide, but... What's the relationship stereochemically of the two halogens? They'll actually be what? Trans to each other. Okay. <laughs> Don't draw the cis product in this case from a, from a uh, medium sized ring here. There's some consequences mechanistically of how this reaction is going to work. And that's what we need to get into. Let's see the mechanism here. So, um, for halogenation, our mechanism is going to involve a different intermediate. And so let's see the initial attack onto molecular bromine here. You see, we'll do this. Okay, and that's like we've done before. There's that partial positive end, and we're breaking that weak bond. And so we're going to this. and bromide, okay? And you might think, well then, you know, okay, that might be a stereocenter like we saw in that dimethyl cyclohexane example a minute ago. And then this can attack from top or bottom and you get a mixture of cis and trans products, right? Well, no, there's a complicating issue here. This bromide and the length of this bond, and there are three lone pairs right here. <laughs> Instead of staying right here as a carbocation, it actually forms what's called a bromonium ion, where we put the plus charge on bromine. How can we do that? Well, <laughs> the bonds are long enough and flexible enough, a lone pair can reach over there. And what does that form? It forms this. <laughs> you might think, well, that, that's... That, that's a resonance structure, really, of that one, right? But no, we had to change the distance of the bond a little bit to get to that point. Yeah, so could we call that a resonance structure? Maybe, but this is a bromonium ion. And actually, everything that we know about halogenation of alkenes, they all go through these halonium ions. So it's called bromonium ion. 
bromonium, meaning the plus charge is on bromine now. Well, what does that do? If this is bridging over and forming this little cis three-membered ring, right? It kind of looks like a cyclopropane, but with a halogen in the middle there. Well, what does this do? Well, then when the bromide attacks here, it's a nucleophile, right? Negatively charged. And what does it have to do? Backside attack, right? <laughs> On either side. So coming down from below here and then knocking those electrons off. And there is a hydrogen here, right? The hydrogen will now be pushed up, right? If this is like a backside attack, like we saw before for SN2, okay? Bromide from the bottom or, or from this side, from the top, either side will give the trans product now. <laughs> What does that go to? See that stereo center here, we already defined that being up, okay? Then we do the backside attack there, the bromide will be down. And it's always the trans product, like we mentioned there. Don't draw the cis, okay? Because the bromonium or the halonium ion, this holds for chlorine as well, okay? Chloronium, if we had chloride going on here. <clears throat> but the bromide, the nucleophile, Attacking here is not on a free carbocation, okay? This is not the intermediate. In fact, we can imagine this going directly from this with the participation of the lone pair here, going directly to the halonium ion, okay? In fact, these have been isolated and studied in, in pure form. You have to do some low temperature things and some careful manipulation. This is a charge thing, an intermediate, so you have to do a lot of special experimental uh, work there to be able to isolate that. But these bromonium or halonium ions are known, and it affects what? The geometry of the product, okay? It's the same thing. We have an electrophile here, okay? We're generating a nucleophile here, okay? And there it is. We're using our nucleophile for the second step. Our initial electrophile, though, is able to bridge over Okay, and form this three-membered ring, which affects the stereochemistry. Now, we could have attacked over here from below, right? And that would have given us what? Inversion on that top one. It's still a trans product, right? What's the relationship between these two? <laughs> Those are both stereocenters, aren't they? <laughs> uh, this is the uh, R, R. And is this the, uh, yep, S, S. I did that pretty fast, right? What is the relationship between the RR and the SS? They're formed 50-50 in this reaction. So we could just say DL for this trans guy here. What's the relationship here? And those are in antimers, okay? So, yeah, but they're governed by the same thing. Either attack from below here or attack from below there. We could have flipped this molecule over and had the bromonium ion with dash bonds back. It would have been the same molecule, right? This intermediate here is achiral. But when we attack from below there or below there, we generate the two enantiomeric forms, okay? So that's a nuance of the mechanism, we'd say. Uh, no front side attack. It goes directly there. Let me give you a couple more examples here before we wrap up. Should wrap up. Let's see. How about this one? With uh, chlorine. Notice we don't have anything else in there. No strong acid, nothing. The halogens on their own are reactive enough. And we're going to generate the trans product. So if we have chloride down there, we need chloride up right here. Okay. And those are two stereocenters. It is a chiral molecule. It'll be fun. Uh, generated as a DL pair, so you can draw the other trans one here with what? This one up and this one down, okay? I'm not going to draw it, but you can see the trans relationship there. Why? Because we had the chloronium ion either on the top or the bottom, and then chloride attacked backside to open it up. Now, let's look at this one. <laughs> Bromine with trans to butene. That's going to give this bromine, bromine, trans, okay? And what is that? Let's see. <laughs> that is a stereocenter. That is a stereocenter. It is trans there. 
It's a good trans here, bromonium ion, top or bottom, and then backside opening. You see the trans relationship here. But look at that, the methyl, methyl here, what? You see a center of symmetry, right? This is the R, S. What is that? Is that chiral? No, that's meso. <laughs> Ah, but let's do this. Let's do the cis to butene. Guess what that will generate? That will give us the chiral version. Okay, in DL form. Okay, this is the uh, RR. It also has the SS generated there. Why? Look at this, the transbutene gives the achiral meso. And look, the cis gives the DL chiral. Oh, we're gonna have to examine the mechanism, form the bromonium ion top or bottom, and then do the backside opening there. And that will indeed give the meso if we attack from either side. But look, if we form bromonium ion on this and then open it up, look, because we've got the different stereochemistry of the alkene, we get a different stereochemical outcome of the product in this case. So we'll pick it up right there next time and go through that details. And then of course we'll do halohydrin and we'll do hydroboration, okay? And, uh, and uh, finish out the H reactions there for chapter 10. Very good, we'll end it there. Any questions come down or email me and we'll see you next time, okay, thanks.